Yo, what's going on, E7 fam? Pat here, back to talk about the custom Mystic Summon for February 29th, 2024. This video will focus on my personal tier list, basically which characters I think are the best ones. How this banner works? Well, we don't really know because as of the recording of this video, we still don't have the specifics. But the general gist of the banner is essentially you'll be able to choose an ML5 star of your choice, except for the three most recent ones and any of the ML4 stars as well. Combine them on a banner and you can use Mystic Summons to actually roll for them, hopefully netting you a Moonlight 5 star that you really, really want. And considering how hard ML5 stars are to get in Epic 7, you want to make sure it's a good one, which is why I am talking about what I think the best ones are some of the pretty good ones and then we'll also talk about what i think are the absolute worst choices for this banner this video is here to give you a quick 20 to 30 second overview of each character and whether that character is good in pvp or pve and also give you some general pros and cons to help you understand why you want to pick one over another i'll also talk about the four stars at the end but only in like very quick detail because this video is probably gonna be very very long Definitely use any timestamps I put down below so that way you can jump to the character that you're most interested in. Basically, highest tier is the best characters going all the way down except for the first one which is just here kind of as like a little note before we get started. And that is the tier of can't choose. Why? So these are the three characters that are excluded from the Mystic Summon banner. It's Abyssal Euphine, Dragon King Sharoon, and Eternal Wanderer Ludwig. So aside from Dragon King Sharoon, who's the most recent banner, we literally just had her just a couple weeks ago, I don't understand why Abyssal and Ludwig are not available. Both of these characters are highly requested and demanded characters by the player base. Abyssal is basically played everywhere by every type of player. And then Eternal Wanderer Ludwig is pretty much the backbone of modern Cleave, which is probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular playstyle, right? So yeah, these are really, really important units. And if the purpose of this banner is to help players catch up and to actually, you know, essentially sell Mystic Packs, like get you to spend to get the characters that you want, I just, I don't understand why these things are not available. If for some reason they just happen to be available sometime throughout the duration of this event as you're watching it, I would put Abyssal in the highest tier along with Eternal Wanderer Ludwig. They would absolutely both be in the highest tier. And the highest tier, is as you could probably guess by seeing it here it's the characters that are the most dominant they have the most amount of power creep they limit the most amount of things your opponents can do they give you the most amount of advantage like these are the characters that essentially warp the game around them as i am recording this video they are uh I guess real fun for you to use, real unfun for your opponent to actually play against you yet. These are definitely the strongest ones. And the characters under here, here underneath of it, Last Rider Crow, Mediator Quirk, they're in the fair characters that let you deal with BS. So these characters are, in my opinion, as strong as the ones in the top tier, but you know, they're not as frustrating for your opponent. Like these are the ones that just feel fair, right? Like they're still like crazy powerful. Let's be uh, real here. But they're the ones that are basically the floodgates that kind of stop the characters above them. I just wanted to give that distinction because, well, I thought it was kind of funny because unlike the top characters, these characters aren't really frustrating to play against. They're just really strong. But uh, yeah, they're just really strong because they are good into a lot of the things that you see up here in the first category. Let's start with the first character in this tier, which is Conquer Lilius. This is a character that is great in almost every single game mode. She's amazing in every single PvP game mode pretty good in things like abyss as well as hall of trials so even if you're a pve only gamer she still provides quite a lot of value she is a drac of all trades character she is extremely fast does almost everything she has strips barriers uh attack down uh cr pushback can provide excellent dps with her s1 kneel down because it can pull your hard carry do big damage she used to be one of the best, if not the best, first pick character in the entire game of World Arena. But because of how many counters there are, they've been really trying to force her out of that first pick slot, like kind of oust her. She's not as strong as a first pick anymore, but she is unquestionably still a must-have character and a top-tier character, in my opinion. If you did not use your Fallen Land selector on her, I definitely think she is still worth picking up. Next up is Death Dealer Ray. He's only really usable in PvP. So if you're a PvE gamer, definitely a skip. 
His S3, Cloud of Death, is a powerful AoE buff strip that has a sleep for the entire enemy team. It is incredibly hard for your opponent to actually deal with. There's very few good ways to actually answer it. There's like Mediator Quirk, Destina, uh, and then like Dragon Kick Sharoon. And based on your opponent's CR, it's not really a reliable option. He is an injury-based character that's very hard for your opponent to stop without immunity because he puts the Venom down and then immediately detonates it. So if you don't have immunity, he will absolutely just run over your entire team. He is very, very debilitating and very, very hard to actually stop. Next up, we have Navy Captain Landy. She's pretty much amazing everywhere in the game. I can't really think of a spot where she's not super broken, maybe like Hunt, and that's about it. She is arguably like the best hyper carry DPS in the entire game. And she also provides survivability to your team with her critical hit resistance buff. There's not too much really to say about Landy here. She is, in my opinion, the number one overall pick for this entire banner. If you don't have her, you're not sure what to get. I think Landy is pretty much the safest option. Next up, we have Spectre Tenebria, who is top tier in both PvE and PvP. Poison Blast, which is her basic skill, that hitting two targets as well as landing poison on enemies makes her a staple for Abyss Floor. So if you're struggling in Abyss, she is definitely one to consider. Her permanent stealth as well as her soul burn extra turn secures her as one of the best world arena characters of all time. And I really don't think she's ever going to fall out of favor as long as Taga Hell's ancient book doesn't get a nerf. Not too much else to say about Spectre Tenebria. If you didn't take her with your original Moonlight Blessing, she's still one of the strongest characters that you can take, especially if you're someone who likes to play very aggressively in PvP. Next up is a character that will probably surprise you if you haven't been paying attention to the current state of all forms of PvP, and that is Urban Shadow Shu. She is very quickly becoming one of the best heroes there. She's great in Guild War Offense as well as Guild War Defense, pretty good in Arena and even in World Arena. She has a team-wide speed buff built into her S3, which is great for team utility, and her bzzzt buff exerts so much pressure on the enemy team. Every single time she takes a turn, she deals 8,000 true damage total to the entire enemy team. That is an insane amount of damage. When you combo that with the amount of injury and bonus damage on the skill 3, you realize that this character can essentially two-shot nearly every single character in the game. She has so much injury in her kit that she basically blocks almost every other HP scaler out of the format. She's essentially like a pseudo tank buster that just keeps bruisers out of the format altogether on a character that's incredibly fast, reasonably tanky, and provides, again, a lot of team utility. Definitely one of the more underrated characters that has come out in the last couple of months before people thought she was good. Now people are finally starting to realize the rat is where it's at. Next up, let's talk about Solitaria of the Snow. So Solitaria is kind of like a control-based, debuff-based version of Spectre Tenebria. She's not really usable in PvE, but when it comes to PvP, she accomplishes similar goals. Spectre sits in stealth the entire game and rains down damage. Solitaria sits in stealth the entire game and rains down a slew of debuffs to frustrate and basically cripple the opposing team. She is incredibly frustrating to play against for your opponent, and if they don't have a way to cleanse all the debuffs that you're going to be raining down on them, well, it's basically a free win. She also shuts down some really popular focus-based heroes, such as Urban Shadow Shu or Ocean Breeze Lulica. Urban Shadow Shu, having a ton of viability right now, makes Solitaria a pretty good pickup as well. If you're somebody who really wants to play the control playstyle, I don't really know how you do it without actually owning Solitary of the Snow. She feels like, in my opinion, a pretty must-have character. Speaking of must-haves, we have to talk about Zeo. So Zeo is a high-speed contester for PvP, and he comes in two distinct playstyles. A high effectiveness build that is usually played on Taga Hell's Ancient Book or on Bloody Rose. And this is usually to set up cleave, control, or aggressive style strategies. For my slower turn 2 players, my tank down and standard players, you might want to consider playing him as a high damage bruiser with the artifact Time Matter. This is so that that way you have a bruiser that can actually take a hit and also be a hard carry for you while still being able to contest fast playstyles. No matter how you play Epic 7, if you want to be, I feel like, competitive at the highest level, say that's Emperor or Legend in World Arena, 
I think Zio is a must-have. Contrary to popular belief, again, I think he is very, very important for turn two players. He's not just something that is only for aggressive players. Next up for the last two of our top tiers is Last Rider Crow, who is an incredibly flexible tank for all forms of PvP. And that's thanks to his S3 mobile weapon, Siegfried. This thing acts as a win condition in a huge variety of team compositions. It also has two turn immunity baked into it, which is super important in case you haven't noticed. A lot of characters that we're playing with right now, they have some pretty debilitating debuffs. And if you have immunity, well, that's pretty amazing, especially if it's two turn immunity because you can get around one turn strips like say Conqueror Lilius. He also with his code number 00 passive has barriers versus AOE and that lets him perform really well against a lot of powerful meta heroes like Abyssal Euphine or Navy Captain Landy or Lone Crest and Bologna. He's just really good in almost every single scenario. If you need a knight that holds Arius, there's very few that do it better than Last Rider Krowl because, well, he's just so extremely well-rounded in the current metagame. And rounding out the last of our top tiers is Mediator Kuer, Mr. Swiss Army Knife himself. This character, in my opinion, feels evergreen. I don't know if he's ever gonna fade out of favor. And if you haven't picked him up from your Fallen Land Selector, he's still a really, really strong option. He has an option for nearly every single scenario in PvP. And he's also pretty good in PvE as well. Think of things like Ancient Inheritance. His S3, Nature Restoration, is the best cleanse in the entire game. You can't stop him from using it. It is a full cleanse and it gives your team the best offensive buffs in the game to boot in two turn immunity and two turn attack buff. His S1 retribution and his S2 balance of power are also game winning abilities when used well. There's just, again, nothing that this man can't do. And I just don't see how he ever actually falls out of favor. People keep saying that he's not as good now as he used to be, but then you just tune into streams and you still see him all the time. So I just, I just don't know why you wouldn't consider picking up Mediator Kuerk. I definitely think he should be one of the finalists on your list, especially if you're struggling in this meta where debuffs are so common. All right, so with the top tier BS characters out of the way, let's talk about the commonly played characters. These are characters that are meta, but not meta warping like the ones that we just talked about per se. So let's start it off with Briar Witch Asaria. So Briar Witch Asaria is a reliable AoE strip plus a two-turn defense break on the opponent's entire team, which allows you to easily punch through enemy defenses. Great for people that like to play very, very aggressively in PvP. She is an anti-revive character thanks to her passive, so neither team can actually revive, so it stops things like Maid Chloe or even like Apocalypse Ravi from getting a revive. So if your opponent is relying on that Destina, for example, pretty good time to take Briar Witch Asaria. She also has a ton of bonus hit chance in her kit, making her great versus dodge based heroes such as Savior Auden, Remnant Violet, or something like Specimen Sets. Next up, we have the god of arena offense as well as Guild War offense in Dark Corvus. Soul burning his S3 Devil's Descent kills most heroes in the game in one hit, and he's got Extinction stapled onto it to boot, so once he kills you, you're gone. There's no way you're coming back. He is a pocket pick in World Arena for when the enemy team has low damage teams or is trying to play control because, well, he can't be stunned. If you're looking for a character that is just going to get you an easy 3-0 every single time in Guild War, let you climb Arena slow but steady, and be a decent character that you can pick in World Arena, I don't really see why you wouldn't pick Dark Corvus. He's just the best Guild War character in the entire game. Next up, we have Faithless Lydica. She is a staple cleave and control setup hero, in my opinion. Some people might have her a bit lower on their list, but considering the state of cleave, you're either going to be playing something built around Eternal Wanderer Ludwig with like Zeo and Ran, or you're probably going to be playing something like Faithless Lydica plus Fumir Cleave. So to me, that says that she is a staple character. And it's all thanks to her S3, Hysteria. This thing outright denies key heroes from getting to play the game. It just resets their skills and they're just kind of useless. 
The problem with Faithless Lydica is that she requires incredibly good gear to play, as well as Guiding Light, which is a limited artifact. If you don't have Guiding Light, or at least several Guiding Lights to be able to play her, plus all their specific characters, you're going to have a hard time. Again, requires really, really good gear, so you have been warned if you're going to take this character. Next up, we have my favorite character in the entire game, which is Lionheart Serbia. She is a warrior that thrives on enemies abusing counterattacks, dual attacks, and extra attacks. She has two ways to be played. Lifesteal set with the Proof of Valor artifact mitigates her biggest weakness, which is her poor bulk, but it comes at the cost of a lot of damage. The current meta build is the Destruction set build with Golden Rose. This has a ton of damage and allows her to absolutely obliterate her opponents, but she still has those bad stats, so she's pretty susceptible to getting blown up which is why she isn't really higher on this list. If you have most of the top tier characters, I don't really think you could go wrong with Lionheart Sermia. She just provides a lot of value in a lot of PvP scenarios. Speaking of characters that provide a lot of value in PvP, we have Lone Crescent Bologna, who is absolutely a fan favorite, and for good reason. She is an extremely high damage reactionary DPS for PvP. Essentially, she's somebody who thrives on countering and getting her S2 passive proc to do huge AOE damage. She always lands critical strikes on every attack, by the way, which makes her great versus Navy Captain Landy, which is one of the best DPS in the entire game. And her damage in general is just so high that she can outright kill most of the meta heroes in the game in one hit, assuming that they don't really have that much mitigation. The only real drawback to Lone Crescent Bologna is that she really, really needs high-end gear. If you don't have extremely good gear, she's going to feel pretty lackluster. She only really starts to feel like a super broken top-tier character when you have extremely good destruction or counter gear on her. Speaking of characters that have hard gear requirements, let's talk about Martial Artist Ken. He is a very well-rounded reactionary DPS. Not super high damage like Lone Crescent Bologna, but again, he feels a little bit tankier, a little bit harder to deal with. Again, another character that's only super good in PvP, and his main niche is that he punishes critical hit-based damage dealers. He has Provoke on Knockout, which triggers whenever they land a critical hit on someone other than him, which will then force them to attack him, which will hopefully trigger his S2, Dragon Flame, which that counter hit does so much damage and certain team compositions simply cannot actually deal with it. There are other ways to play him, by the way, such as a really fast cleave opener with defense break. But no matter how you choose to play him, he's going to need really good gear to get him to work. Otherwise, he's super easy to beat, right? He's super easy to control, or he can just outright die in one hit from a character like Savior Odin. So if you don't have that good gear, even if he's really cool, he might not be the character for you. Our next tier is the sometimes played tier. These characters are by no means bad. In some cases, these characters are better than the commonly played characters or even the BS characters, right? The super top tiers. It's just that they're a little bit more niche. You can't just pick them every single game, but when they're good, they're really, really good. So let's start it off with my man, Ambitious Tywin. Ambitious Tywin is an anti-debuff tank that doubles as a control win condition for PvP. So he's good versus control. He can be your Arius holder. And well, he could also just win the game for you by himself. And that's because his S3 flash is ridiculous. It's an AoE attack that stuns the entire enemy team and also defense breaks them. And if you soul burn it, it basically can be up every other turn. The problems with Ambitious Tywin or that he can very easily get overwhelmed by lots of debuffs. Battle Command only really cleanses one thing per one turn rotation. He's also shut down really hard by immunity, which is kind of a staple right now considering how rampant control is actually in the meta. So he's really difficult to pick early, which is kind of where you want to be picking your tank. Next up, oh how the mighty have fallen. Apocalypse Ravi. This character is still kind of good, but has some issues. For those of you who don't know, she used to be the best character in the game. She is a tanky bruiser that is meant to anchor your team in PvP, allowing for some pretty spectacular comeback scenarios. Her S2 passive War God's Might makes her incredibly hard for certain heroes to actually kill her, and her S3 Deliverance is a powerful single target nuke that also revives a fallen ally if it secures a kill, hence making her an amazing anchor. The problem is, the metagame is really hostile towards this character right now. 
Control and injury based compositions are everywhere. And she's bad against both of those things. So it's hard to use her anywhere other than a fourth or fifth pick scenario in World Arena when your opponent just doesn't really have a way to deal with her. Next, let's talk about Architect Laika, who is a powerful last pick in World Arena. Essentially, she's the character you pick where if you want it dead, it's dead. If she gets a turn and she gets her soul burn off, it is pretty much a guaranteed kill on any character in the game. If your opponent can't contest her speed, can't stop her from using her soul burn with a character like Bellion or kind of denying it with a non-attack skill denier like Selene or some kind of CR reducer like say Abyssal Euphine's passive, if they don't have something like that and they let the character through, she's outright killing whatever you want, which oftentimes leads to a easy win. But because she's restricted to a last pick most of the time, it means that she's going to be pretty commonly banned. So even though she's great, it's not going to feel like you get too much mileage out of the character, which is why it's hard for me to really put her higher on this list, even though her power feels like somebody you'd want to pick in commonly played. Next up is Astromancer Elena, which is a character I've been pretty harsh on, but now that I have her, I realize she's a little bit better than I gave her credit. She's a character that's meant to stop your opponents from using counterattacks as long as she's still alive with her actual passive. The problem is she's pretty squishy, so it's hard to make use of her in World Arena. That said, versus AI in things like Guild Wars and Arena, it's significantly easier to protect her and set her up, making her great for players who want to cleave really easily in PvP game modes like Arena Offense or Guild War Offense, and I think that's really where she shines. If you're somebody who likes to play a lot of regular Arena and doesn't really care about World Arena, Astromancer Elena is an amazing pickup for you, especially if you like to play very fast team compositions. Ah, yes. God Queen Bellion's next. This is the only character in the game that stops soul generation on the enemy team thanks to her S2 passive Shackles of Suppression. This character has a lot of counter picks though in the current meta, so you can't really pick her early. And the players you'd want to pick her against are usually pre-banning her, which kind of makes her feel like Architect Laika. She kind of gets banned in the scenarios that you really, really want her, but I guess that's again a testament to how powerful the character actually is. The best build in my opinion for her right now is the counter set with Elbrus Ritual Sword that I talk about in how to play Bellion, but there is a new build that has arisen since I made that video. It is essentially an anti-cleave version of Bellion where she is on the Arius artifact with the protection set and she uses all HP subs on the right side. Basically no speed, no real damage, just trying to get the Bellion to be as tanky as possible, share damage with Arius and the barriers from the protection set, and just pray that you hold on long enough to get the win because, well, the opponent shouldn't have any souls, so no real offensive capability, you should easily be able to weather the storm. Next up, let's talk about Commander Pavel. Pavel is, in my opinion, a core cleave DPS. He is probably one of the more reliable fourth picks for cleave to actually close out a game. So if you're serious about cleave, he's definitely one to consider. He also doubles as the fastest adventure farmer in the game, but I don't think you want to take an ML5 just to be able to farm on recorded history. Do note, he requires extremely high-end DPS gear to do well with in World Arena, and some of his teammates, such as Zeo, are going to need really specific builds in order to get the most out of the synergy between the two characters, so you have been warned. Next up is Designer Lilibet. This is a bruiser that doubles as a cleanser with slight hints of control thanks to the silence and cooldown pushback that are in her kit. While she is an excellent cleanser thanks to model disqualification, it's not without its problems. It's an AoE attack, which means it's basically susceptible to all sorts of harmful based passive skills and counter attacks. Also, the thing can't cleanse bombs, which is another knock against it. That said, her S2 passive emergency stitching is amazing. Versus control compositions, she can't really be controlled, which means if she's built as a actual reliable off DPS or dare I say carry, she can absolutely win the game for your team solo. Next up is one of my favorite ML5 stars in Little Queen Charlotte. She is a powerful anti-dark single target nuke for all forms of PvP. She pairs incredibly well, by the way, with tanks and supports due to the fact that her passive skill is essentially Adamant Shield. If you've ever played with Arius and Adamant Shield on the same team, you realize just how much damage mitigation it provides. And she's going to need it because her biggest drawback is actually her balanced stat pool. She wants a lot of damage, but also needs to be able to survive. And if you build for bulk and damage, 
Well, she's pretty slow, which means she's super susceptible to dying without mitigation on her team or proper supports to give her combat readiness or barriers to protect her. Next up, we have Maid Chloe, who's a really, really good compliment, by the way, to our previous character, Little Queen Charlotte. Maid Chloe is a cleanser, healer, and reviver all in one neat package, and she's really good in almost every single game mode, except for like, again, maybe Hunt. So a lot of value in this character. Not super broken, but again, pretty high value pick in my opinion. Her effect resistance granting passive stacks with Shamadra Staff, the artifact by the way, which allows you to get 40% extra ER to your entire team. This allows you to gear characters in such a way that they can kind of cheat effect resistance thresholds if you plan to use her often. Essentially, it makes the gearing process easier if you build your entire account around Maid Chloe. The problem with that is, well, the character has a lot of counters, so it's pretty difficult to pick her early and often in World Arena without a well-defined plan. So if you're going to invest in Maid Chloe, you kind of have to go all in, build your whole account around her, and really understand the ins and outs of her. Many players have had great success with this character over the years, but she's not exactly for everyone, so just keep that in mind. Speaking of characters that might not be for everybody, <laughs> Pirate Captain Flan. This is a character that, um, story-wise, not a big fan of. Gameplay-wise, though, she's pretty fun. She is a high damage control unit for PvP that can lock out entire enemy teams with her bombs. The problem is, like with most other control characters, because of how strong they are, most people are going to be playing a lot of cleansers or have a lot of counters on deck to actually deal with the character. So her best use is to take her in the later stages of the draft when your opponent isn't very fast and doesn't really have too many picks to actually answer the bombs that are in her kit. Do note that she requires a limited artifact star of the deep sea to play, so if you're newer and haven't picked that up from the custom group summon with Summertime Asaria, this character loses almost all of her value. Is definitely a prerequisite to be able to play the character. Next up is God himself, as people call him, Remnant Violet. He is a very, very powerful single target DPS for PvP, and he also has some PvE uses. I personally use him a lot in Automaton Tower. He has a very flexible playstyle in that he can be played proactively as a fast speed set DPS or reactively as a slow lifesteal DPS. He is super susceptible to all of the anti-dodge characters like his peers such as Savior Auden and Specimen Says. The thing is though, his dodge is not innately built into the kit, which means not attack strips like the one found on Conqueror Elias kind of hose him really, really badly. So you can't really pick him early like you can with those characters. He's kind of reserved for a third, fourth, or fifth pick slot in a lot of World Arena games. Still one of the stronger single target DPS though in the entire game. Next up, we have Requiem Rowana, who is another really strong asset to cleave composition. She is a very powerful control character that slots into those types of strategies. Her S3 Eternal Lament resets enemy cooldowns and allows for some pretty easy wins if she is unhindered. The biggest issue with her is that she requires extremely high-end gear to do well with. She is got gear that very few people actually have access to. Her most common build is on six pieces of hit set gear, but they all need really high attack percentage substats, which is generally not something you're trying to actually get on the hit set. Next up is a character that I really, really enjoy playing, and that is Sage Ball and Cezanne. He is an anti-cleave control mage for PvP. He can be built one of two ways, either high effect resistance, so it's super hard to stop him from disrupting the enemy team, or on a high effectiveness build with Abyssal Crown to basically further increase his ability to lock down entire teams with not only his sleeps, but the added stuns. The biggest problems with Sage Ball and Zazan right now are that anti-combat radius push passives really hurt him, and those are super common thanks to Abyssal Euphine right now. Also, a lot of openers in the format completely bypass effect resistance entirely, which means that his build that's hard to disrupt isn't exactly super hard to disrupt. So. He's just kind of inconsistent at the highest level because there's just a lot of ways of dealing with it. Still a great option for you to have, especially if you are a slower player. Next up is a character that I did a guide on recently for, and that is Specimen Says. Think of him kind of like a higher risk, higher reward version of Savior Auden for all forms of PvP. His S3 Lightstorm as well as his S2 Evil Claws do insane damage, even if there are no stuns on the targets. 
The problem with him is that he has no way to innately punish people for attacking him. Even if he dodges, he doesn't really have any innate counters or combat radius pushes, which means your opponent can deal with him a lot easier than other dodge based characters. They can essentially just lay into him and kill him before he actually gets set up or gets to do his actual job. So that's kind of his biggest drawback. Again though, that damage is out of this world. So if you wanted to see big numbers and see things explode, still incredibly fun character to play. Next up is Spirit Eye Selene, a character that I really want to like, but there's some really wonky things with this character as far as design goes. Design-wise, how Spirit Eye Selene works is essentially as a team-wide reviver that just happens to be unable to be killed by characters that have critical hits. So if your opponent's DPS can only land critical strikes, well, they have no real way of killing her and thus you win the game by default because you keep bringing your team back with your team-wide revive. So when she works, super broken character. The thing is, things like burns just bypass her ability to just survive forever. True damage kills her pretty much instantaneously. Rocket punch with its splash damage or anything on Karina, that can also outright kill the character. So yeah, she's pretty easy to counter if you draft her super early in World Arena. I've seen a number of people who can make it work, but it's very, very difficult. Again, very feast or famine character, either super broken or just completely worthless or super easy to counter. I personally only really like using this character in Guild Wars. I think she's just super risky to use anytime outside of that. Next up, we have a fan favorite in Straze. Straze is an anti-tank damage dealer for PvP and also the best hunt character in all of Epic 7. He is extremely fragile and not very fast in PvP, but if he does get a turn, his S3 Star Extinction is almost guaranteed to kill something, which is really, really great for aggressive players. The best hunt teams, by the way, in Epic 7 are built around him, but they do require extremely good gear, specifically on the Rage set. This character would be much higher on this tier list if it wasn't for Rift, by the way, because Rift has kind of replaced Hunt for most of the endgame players, and well, you can't play Straze there. But if you're still somebody who is dedicated to that Hunt life, he's definitely somebody I recommend picking up. All right, with that out of the way, let's move on to our next tier, which is the We're Hot, but not super commonly played, but we're better than everyone below us tier. And I don't think I really have to explain this one too much. Everyone in this tier is uh, pretty good looking. Even my man, Twisted Idol on Care on here, if you know what I'm saying, yeah. So all these characters, pretty hot. They're playable, but man, there's some, there's some things here that kind of just make it really frustrating. Like they could be a lot better with just a couple of tweaks or maybe a couple of stat changes here or there. So let's start off with Archdemon Shadow. So Archdemon Shadow is an AoE DPS with the ability to seal passive skills, making her really good versus a lot of top tiers, because what makes top tiers good is usually either their speed or some kind of broken passive. The problem is, is that she's really hard to use, right? There are a lot of counters against this character. Immunity is incredibly common, so it's very hard to get her seal down on the specific targets or get like blind or burns, which are the other debuffs in her kit. And well, if her S2 just doesn't proc or you don't get counter set procs, feels like the character is worthless. So she is very, very inconsistent at high level. She also requires a limited artifact, Fairy Tale for a Nightmare to be decent. You could play Iella Violin to get around the immunity, but then you just don't really do as much damage without Fairy Tale for a Nightmare. So it's kind of rough, right? Being an Archdemon fan is suffering. Speaking of suffering, we have Judge Kisei next. I feel like suffering is the name of the game if you're a Judge Kisei fan, because this character has been bad for so long and she just had a rework and she still, as you can tell by her tier placement, isn't exactly good. So what Judge Kisei is supposed to be is a warrior who can reset enemy cooldowns, defense break the enemy team, and deny counterattacks. In actuality, she is a warrior with really bad stats to go with her kit. She would be better suited if she was a ranger for Guiding Light or a mage for access to Hegel's Ancient Book, which she kind of really needs in order to do her job. She's just really easy to counter, very hard to set up, and super inconsistent at her job overall. You can still make this character work if you're a huge fan of her, just know it's going to require really good gear, 
and also really good setups that your opponent isn't going to be able to see coming. If they can predict that, well, the character just doesn't really have a whole heck of a lot of value. Speaking of value, let's talk about Operator Segret, who, unlike George Kise, whose value feels like it's going down, Operator Segret's value feels like it's going up. Let me explain. So Operator Segret is an anti-barrier assassin for PvP. She suffers from really poor base stats, so you need to hyper-invest in damage in order to actually do something with her. And that usually comes at the expense of speed, which makes her somewhat inconsistent and hard to use. That said, barriers are on the rise because of characters like Urban Shadow Shu. So maybe her value will actually go up as more and more barrier characters start to see play. Next up, we have, in my opinion, the hottest character in the game. And I will not hear it about anybody else. You could tell me Luna or anybody else you want in the comment section. It is Sylvan Sage. She is absolutely the hottest character in this game. You cannot change my mind. The thing about Sylvan Sage Vivian is that she is a jack of all trades, master of none character, just like Conqueror Lilius. But the thing is, Conqueror Lilius is a lot more well rounded and a lot faster with a lot more support skills than Sylvan Sage Vivian. She is essentially just an AoE mage that just happens to have a little bit of team utility in the healing and buff department. She's great if you need a safe AoE DPS, but she kind of does little outside of it. That's the thing, right? She doesn't hit the hardest, right? She's not the most explosive. She's just well-rounded, and usually well-rounded characters don't exactly perform the best in Epic 7. The last character in this section is Hinojin's Husbando, Twisted Idol on Kron. He is a slow damage dealer that punishes equally slow teams that have a lot of buffs on them. His S3 Sword of Requiem is a near game ending ultimate, if you can get enough stacks on him. Emphasis on if, right? And that's because, well, he is the dreaded Scorpio Thief, which means, well, he is made of paper. The game tries to get you to not attack him, basically deter attacking him by giving him a counter buff, but that could easily get stripped by somebody with a ton of effectives, so you kind of have to just dedicate a ton of ER to the character. And the really good debuffers, well, they're still going to get through anyway, right? So he kind of is relying on characters like, say, Christy and like Bastion of Hope and things like that in order to actually do his job. But even then, at the end of the day, he is a Scorpio Thief, so he's made of paper. He's probably going to get evaporated. Really good when he works, if, again, he works. That brings us to rarely used. These are the characters that I think kind of really need some help. These are the ones that I would not recommend taking unless, well, you have everybody else above it, right? So here we go. Let's start it off with Arbiter Vildred, who used to be the best damage dealer in the game. The problem is nowadays he's too easy to kill and he doesn't really do enough damage. Like it's funny because he used to be known for insane damage. Now it feels like he can't kill anything except for squishy cleave based characters. Still pretty good as an adventurer farmer though for unrecorded history. Next up is Closer Charles. He is a cleave opener, but he's really hard to gear and use due to his base stats. Now I know there are players out there who can make use of him, namely KJ for example. He loves playing Closer Charles, but KJ has some of the best gear in the entire world and only players of his caliber I feel like can really bring out the most of him. Otherwise, it's better to just invest in other characters. His best use right now, in my opinion, is for Azimatic 13 as a one-shot character, where he's quite a bit faster than a lot of the other alternatives. Next up, we have Desert Jewel Basar, Mr. Jojo himself. He is an anti-barrier healer as well as a cleanser, right? The thing is, we are in what I like to call a Soul Weaver Renaissance, meaning that anything DJB can do, a lot of other heroes could do too, because the Soul Weaver quality is so good right now. There are so many great Soul Weavers to choose from. And the only thing that really separates him from his peers is his barrier inversion. So if you wanted any other feature in his kit besides the barrier inversion, there's probably someone who could do it better than him or, you know, just as good as him with way better stats because his stat line is kind of trash. Not a bad character. Again, though, it's hard to recommend him when there are so many other alternatives out there in the game right now. Next up is my girl, Fallen Cecilia, still probably my favorite tank in the entire game. And she used to be the best tank in the game, but man, she definitely needs some help because right now, the only thing I think she's amazing with is against Cleave. 
If you're playing against Cleave Comp, she's absolutely one of the best. But the thing is, she's competing with Eaton, who is a three star. So what does that really say about the state of the character? Versus anything that's not Cleave, she doesn't really present any potential game winning plays or threats like Last Rider Crow does or Yulha does or even somebody like Unbound Knight Arwell, right? Arwell has a game winning potential strip and stun. Fallen Cecilia has nothing like that, which is why she is this low. And she definitely needs some love. Smogate, please. Okay, speaking of characters that I would love to receive some quality of life updates is Ruel of Light, who is my favorite Soul Weaver in the entire game. And she's definitely fallen on some hard times. Ruel is a healer, cleanser, and reviver all in one for all game modes. The problem is, well, everything she has is single target. And it's on a really long cooldown. So if you're fighting anything with a lot of AoE, she feels kind of useless. If you don't have enough gear to make her kind of decently fast, it's going to feel like an eternity before she can actually heal you, right? And the thing is, when it comes to PvP... Well, if you try to build her with enough ER so that that way she doesn't get debuffed, well, she's paper thin and she can get killed by a lot of DPS in the game in one hit, like, say, Remnant Violet or Specimen Sets. So to counteract that, you have to build her tanky, but that means that she has no effect resistance, which means she is super easy to control. Feels really bad, man, to be a Ruel fan in 2024. Please, again, Smogate, help me out. Help my girl out, please. I'm begging you. Now, to complete the trifecta of characters that Sue used to really like playing but doesn't get to play anymore, we have Silverblade Araminta. She used to be the former best character in the entire game, thanks to being the only hero in the game with 100% AoE stun. And she still has that. The problem is that it's just super hard to use her currently, right? She needs really high speed, really high effectiveness, and she also needs high bulk so that, that way she doesn't get killed in one hit. And on top of that, as we've talked about with all the other debuffers in the game, immunity and cleansing is running super, super rampant. It's just too easy to counter this character, too easy to disrupt her, I feel like, in this day and age. Honestly, I blame Angel of Light Angelica because once we got her, everything just needed to start being immune to actual debuffs, needed to start being able to break out of actual debuffs, right? And that just made it so that Silverblade Armenta, who used to be just like okay-ish to kind of bad just kind of stayed there, even despite all of her buffs and reworks and things like that. I just don't know how you ever actually get this character to be viable without actually giving up her 100% AoE stun, right? Lastly in this tier, we have top model Lulica. They basically reworked this character so that she is Closer Charles with a single target nuke. The problem is Closer Charles already is in this same tier, so he's not exactly the greatest, right? This character is just not fast enough to be an opener, she's super squishy, she's hard to gear, and she get pu gets punished entirely by any non-attack skill punish, because, well, if you don't use her S2 non-attack skill, she's not going to be able to really kill anything, and if she can't kill anything, that's pretty much her only role, right? So, yeah, it's hard for me to really recommend top model Lulika. So, our second to last tier, as you can probably guess here, is called literally anything else. So, Better than just not rolling on the banner, almost, kind of, right? Unless, like, the next character I'm going to talk about is the only character in the game you don't have. It's probably a better idea to save your resources. And that is the man, the myth, the legend, Blood Moon Haste. So what do you do? Right? What 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 do you do, Blood Moon Haste? Because Briar Witch Asaria took everything from you. And you have nothing really good to show for it, right? One of the slowest Soul Weavers in the entire game. Pretty lackluster healing. Damage mitigation, sure, but it's not a whole heck of a lot. S2 is basically super easy to stop with unbuffable uh, and all the strips that are in the game right now. And uh, S1 is just a pretty pitiful strip. So yeah, he sucks. And you should absolutely be on the uh, balance adjustment preview whenever we get that. Uh, supposedly, it's this week. If any of the characters do change in that balance adjustment preview, I'll talk more about where I would put them in these various different tiers during that video. So do stay tuned for that. Last thing before we close it out, here is the ML4 star tier list that I would take accompanying your ML5 stars in case you want it. Main ones to focus on are these top five. If you're somebody who really cares about PvE content, specifically things like Expedition or Abyss or like Ancient Inheritance, I think Kitty Clarissa and Simple Angelica are must-pull. Simple Angelica also has a lot of value 
for things like hunts. So if you're not doing Rift, but you're trying to get your hunt teams in order, really great character to pick up. I think these are just mandatory pickups if you care about high-end PvE content at all. As for PvP, AOL, Crimson Armin, Moon Buddy are pretty much all staple characters in PvP. And then you have it commonly played here, right? There's BBK, G Perg, Inferno, Infinite Horizon to Kades for like the anti uh, cleave. You have LPK here for the anti dodge. Watcher Shuri, pretty good for cleave comps, also pretty good for hunts. Uh, anything below this, I would only take it if you just don't have it, right? Like, I would focus mainly on these three tiers, specifically these top two, though, right? So that's going to do it for the video. As always, let me know your thoughts down below. If I missed anything, if you need any more questions uh, answered, I'll answer them down in the comments below or just hit me up on Discord. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. Catch you in the next one. Later.